In page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, Ellen White says, in case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. And we do that through the history and the symptoms, unhealthful conditions changed, wrong habits corrected, their nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system. And you can see how water therapies can play a, play a large part in that. Now, I was just asked a question on prolapse. Will prolapse benefit from the sit spas? Absolutely. But as you can imagine, it's a bit of work. But the, but the rewards far exceed the effort put into it. But here is something that is handy to know with prolapses. What's prolapse? Prolapse can be prolapse of the colon, can be prolapse of the uterus, we're constantly fighting gravity that's always pulling us down. And if a person's got strong abdominal muscles and internal muscles, they will not have a prolapse. And hot and colds can, can certainly revive muscles, but exercise really is the most important thing. And muscle knows no age. That means whether you're 9 or 90, you can have strong muscles. But an old remedy for a prolapse is is let's say this is a lounge chair and you put a board on it, a board like that, mm -hmm. and a pillow there. Mm -hmm. Now I, I've got to put, <coughs> this is a little bit out of, let me try and do it a bit more in range. Mm -hmm. So you put a pillow there and the person lays here they are, and they're very happy because this is going to fix them. Sorry, the eye should go there, I think. And the body goes here, and the knees are there, and then the feet come down like that. Okay? Now, can you imagine what's happening to your prolapse? It's falling up. And often the person only needs to to lay on that board for 10 minutes a day. If it's more serious, 10 minutes twice a day. Now what you'll find happens is, and the way I've drawn it looks very steep, it, could, it certainly could be relaxed a little bit and you know the head usually is on the pillow, maybe we draw it properly. And what some people will do is read a book. <laughs> or listen to some nice music or something. So whether that be prolapse of the colon, prolapse of the uterus, uh, prolapse of even of the uterus. Mm -hmm. Now at the same time, do you remember that I said next week you're going to be making programs for people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so everything I'm showing you here, you'll take a little bit from here, from there, from there. So with the prolapse, Absolutely, we want some vibrant blood to heal. So we want to make sure well hydrated, uh, a nutritious diet, that they're sleeping properly every night for the full eight hours, as you'll see. No stimulants going in that are going to leach minerals out of the body. Sunshine, lay in the sun every day. That might be nice to lay outside in the sun when you're having it. <laughs> Pure air, but even just to lay outside and bear the abdominal area for the sun. The darker the skin, the more sun can be born, as we will see when we look at sunshine. <laughs> and of course, you know, if they're excited with the results, they can do that three times a day. You can't overdo it, but I don't think anyone's going to want to lie like that for more than 10 minutes. And another thing is, now have mercy on me, I'm not a great drawer. Say so this is your bed, and every night when you pray, <coughs> you take this position. Okay? Now when you're in that position, what's happening to your internal organs? Can you see they're falling up? And then when you finish praying, you just roll over and go to sleep. You know what that means? Your internal organs are in position all night. Mm. And if you get up to go to the bathroom, it's a good idea to 
continue doing that. Pray again. Yes. <laughs> you probably only need to be in that position for about five minutes to ensure, and you can certainly be in that position longer, to ensure that the eternal, internal organs are back into place and then lay down and go to sleep. So th there are some very simple things that you can do for a prolapse. And it needs to be given a little bit of time. Do you know what we find, and one lady testified to this, let's say her prolapse usually falls out within an hour. Well, when she started doing this, it would stay in for 55 minutes. The next day it would stay in for 53 minutes. The next day it would, sorry, it's falling out every every hour. Uh -huh. Can you see what I'm saying? Is that every time she did it, it stayed in a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. Now you take that over a month, <laughs> a few minutes every day for a month where it's staying in longer and longer and longer. And that's how it works. And I have had a couple of elderly women who are now past told me that that's how they heal their prolapses. Because the option today is to have surgery mm -hmm and have mesh in there. And there's been a lot of testimonies of people who've been hurt by that mesh. Mm -hmm. What about fevers? So three things to remember with a fever. Number one, it is your friend. Who created the body to have a fever? God. God did. It's a natural response in the body, a fever. So remember, fever is your friend. It has a purpose. It has a purpose. What is the purpose? Well, when the body heats up, do you know it makes white blood cells at twice the rate? Circulation so it moves through the body at a lot faster rate. What does that mean? More oxygen, more nutrients, more water is available for the body, more waste being taken away. Number two, oh, and by the way, that high heat has the ability to kill some harmful microbes in the body. Water puts the fire out. Water puts the fire out. And I'm going to show you some simple treatments that will work with the body to speed up the uh, body recovering from a fever. Number three, when all the rubbish is burnt up, the fire will go out. So if the fever comes back, it's because the body needs it to come back. What if it comes back every day for seven days? Well, it's still got work to do. So when the work is finished, the fire goes out. The fire is out. Because what are we told? We're told that the fever is an enemy. In fact, when I was in lockdown for two weeks, every day the nurse would ring me. Do you have a sniffle? Do you have a sore throat? Do you have a fever? No, 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 I don't. And I think if I had it, I don't think I'd actually let her know. <laughs> no, I'm in the room by myself. I would not lie because lying lips are an abomination to God. <laughs> but sometimes you don't have to tell everything, is that right? If I'm asked, of course I'll be truthful. So water puts the fire out. It's absolutely vital that they be well hydrated because when a fever's happening, there's a lot more perspiration, so they're losing a lot more water. And remember that perspiration is salty, so what else do they need? A little bit of Celtic salt. You know, at church, sometimes you have old ladies giving children lollies. Mm. You know what I do? I give them all salt. I've got a little container, a little salt. My grandchildren go to my bag. We have some salt. Nana. Yeah. And you know what they do as soon as they've had the salt? Drink, Drink water. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes when my little grandsons are there, I say, when you've drunk half a glass of wood, you can have a little bit of salt. <laughs> and then I'll drink the other glass. 
I say to them, have you watered your garden this morning? Yes, Grandma, we've watered our garden. Half of my children called me Nana, the other half Grandma. <laughs> so that's what a fever does. And it's important to understand that. In fact, every afternoon at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, we create a fever. That's what's happening in the steam sauna. We're creating a fever. And fevers have been used to help conquer illness for thousands of years all through Europe. Something else that the fever does, it stimulates your bone marrow to make more white blood cells. And we have five different types of white blood cells. We have neutrophils. And neutrophils make up, I think it's about 60% of the white blood cells. They're the ones that encompass the pathogen, kill it with um, peroxide, did you know that? Hydrogen peroxide, and basically give their life. That's why, that's what passes dead white blood cells. They're all your neutrophils that have just laid down their life for you. And then you've got monocytes. And you've got uh, leukocytes. No, lymphocytes, sorry. Leukocytes is the name given to all white blood cells, lymphocytes. Now, lymphocytes are the white blood cells that are made in your lymphatic system. Your lymphatic system sweeps away waste from the tissues. We'll be looking at that in a bit more detail later in the week. And when the lymphocytes <coughs> sweep away waste from the tissue, it goes into the lymph nodes where there are lymphocytes. But you've also got lymphocytes floating through your blood. And your lymphocytes are the scouts. And they're, they're always looking for any problems. And they tell the neutrophils, there's a problem over here. We've got a problem in this boy's finger. We've got a problem here. We've got a problem in these lungs, which brings more to the area. And basophils is the other white blood cell and eosinophil. And eosinophils take up about 2%. Basophils take up about 3%. You said 3%. No, I've just got to get the percentage right in these others. I've got a roundabout way. So I think, ah, uh, let's see. If this takes up 15%, so this is 20%, yeah? Am I, is my maths right? Any mathematicians in the room? Okay, so that, that's about uh, the amount of our white blood cells that we have. And remember, they're your internal army. We hear a lot about the immune system, don't we? Their immune system. And if you've got a cold, or you've got any problem happening in your body, you will have more of your white blood cells. And if someone says, I've got a cold, my immune system must be down. No, it's because your immune system's high that you've got the cold. Mm -hmm. See, people say these things, but they don't realize what it means. And just the fever increases the white blood cells, helps to fight whatever's happening in your body. Our body's been designed to heal itself. We've got an amazing immune system there. But sometimes the eosinophils can get too high. And the eosinophils are the histamine carriers. And if someone has too much histamine in their body, what will they be given? Antihistamine. Is it because it's A, isn't it? Yes. It's because of an allergy. When there's an allergy response, if someone's got hist got high histamines, they've got an allergy response. Is hay fever? Yeah, uh, an allergy. 
and there are five common allergens. And you will find in many diseases these five common allergens uh, play a role. Peanuts, and remember what we said this morning, it's actually not the peanut, what is it? It's the mould on the peanut. Number two, dairy. There weren't near as many allergies to dairy when the milk was raw from organic cows. <laughs> but I have to tell you, we are the only creature that eats another creature's milk. Is that right? And milk is meant for babies. So if people say, what milk do you drink? I say, I'm weaned. I've got teeth. I eat food. <laughs> And number three is wheat. And I'll be exploring this in more detail in some of the other lectures. But in the 1950s, wheat was hybridised. It went through intensive crossbreeding to produce a plant with a high yield of grain. Why did they do that? They did it to um, help with the starvation crisis in Africa, India, Mexico. In fact, the research was done mostly in Mexico. And when they first had produced this wheat plant with a high yield of grain, before, before they could harvest, the stalk broke because <laughs> the yield was so heavy. So they went back to the drawing board. And you will find today, wheat only grows that high. And it has a thick stem, so it can handle the heavy yield of grain. And they have, um uh, straw shortening. Yeah, it's shorter. Yeah, but you have a, a, a chemical that it is spread uh, to shorten the straws. Ah, yes, yeah. there's, a, there's also a chemical that, that inhibits its growth. Yeah. Yeah, so, what have we got on top? We've got on top of that a chemical as well. Yeah. That, and yeah. that, that is the wheat that is used today. And it was rushed through with no safety studies. Yeah. Yes? Also, the root system doesn't go as far down as it used to, so it means that it doesn't take up as much uh, nutrients. That's it's right, it's not yeah. taking up as much and nutrients. Not, and, not as much water either. So it, no. it's and the other factor is that it's usually grown with um, uh, glyphosate or Roundup. Mm -hmm. Now what these chemicals do is they inhibit the microbes in the soil so the microbes can't get the nutrients out of the soil and put it into the plant. So there's a whole lot of problems yeah. with the weed of today. And in the book Temperance, chapter 2, page 2, Ellen White gives an illustration of uh, Satan and his angels having a conference about what... What was the most misery they could bring to mankind? And Satan himself came up with a plan. Mm -hmm. He would use the fruit of the vine, mm -hmm. and we all we know the misery that alcohol has caused, and wheat and other foods used for food. The wheat is the only food that is mentioned there. Now that was written a hundred years before the hybridization of the wheat. So usually the wheat that God made had a very um, delicate or fragile protein or gluten structure. Fragile means easily digested. He's not sure when, but it was probably a couple of thousand years ago, this original wheat called Enkenhorn did a wild hybrid with a field grass and came up with the Emma strain of wheat. This is E double M E R. Now can you see it's not quite as fragile? And that Emma is the wheat that was put through the intensive crossbreeding and came up with the hybridized wheat. And that gluten structure on the hybridized wheat is incredibly complex. It's almost only a cast iron gut that can break that down and there aren't many cast iron guts around. And if they keep eating it, uh, it won't be cast iron much longer. Now, if that flour is made into a sourdough, which is culturing the bread, it breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain and makes it less complex. 
sourdough bread is almost like eating pre-digested grain. It's, it's been cultured or broken down. And it was only in, in the Industrial Revolution that uh, people started making yeast bread. Before that, all bread worldwide was the sourdough bread. So imagine the uh, Israelites in the desert. Once a year on the Passover, they had to put the leaven out of their houses. What was the leaven? It was the sourdough culture. Yeah. Once a year? Yeah, on the Passover. Mm-hmm. When they s- how you should have it for generations. They say that sourdough starters, you should have yeah. it for years and years and years. You do. So after the week, they'd run out, get their little starters, put a bit of flour and water, revive it, and go back to making bread. So it was only that week. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, I think it is, uh, the Bible says, No, you're not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It's referring to the sourdough. And I think it's in Luke, Jesus gives the story of a kingdom of heaven. He's like under a woman that took her leaven and put it in a whole lump and it leavened the whole lump. So the Bible refers to the sourdough bread. People have said to me, but Ellen White said we shouldn't eat sourdough bread. I said, where does it say that? Mm. Ellen White says bread shouldn't be heavy and sour, but light and sweet. She's not referring to the, to the sourdough bread. She's referring to bread that was allowed to culture too long and become heavy and sour. Now, I, I just wanted to make a point. When the manipulated the wheat. My parents were large-scale farmers in Kenya. They did do it for Africans. They did it in the new um, liberal, the new liberal thinking, so that they could deplete everything for Africans. My farm, my parents, as I've said, were large-scale farmers. Everything came to a standstill. We used to grow wheat mm. in large. We used to grow sunflower and all this. You see, though, you were able to keep your seed, weren't you? Yeah, but now it has been so manipulated yes. that it cannot be planted. And yes. the soil is so depleted. So That's that right, the soil is depleted. We want the, the fertilizer, so in that way, effectively, they have killed Africa. That's true. That's true. That's absolutely true. And on top of what they've done to Africa there, the pharmaceutical companies come in yeah. and they have experimented so much on the Africans. Yeah more than any other country. No wonder the Africans are sick. Judgment day will come and they will have to answer to God for what they have done. That is what gives us comfort. Yeah, that's right. The spelt. The spelt grain is a wild hybrid of this emma, emma bread. So your spelt has a less complex protein structure. And if that spelt is made into a sourdough, the sourdough will bring the structure way back to the original fragile structure. So if you do eat bread, it should be the ancient grains. They often call them the ancient grains and the sourdough. The sourdough is the best because it makes the grain so much more digestible. You've heard of lectins. We'll be covering lectins in another lecture. Lectins are a component of plant. It's high in unripe fruit, (laughs) low in ripe fruit. But uh, the wheat is high in lectins, but the sourdough process kills the lectins. So it's the sourdough is the best way to have. Yes? I don't know if you have experience with it. Like, uh, well, my question is, uh, the flowers and those, uh, we've tried with, with the whole flower, but it's so much more difficult than the white flower. Maybe this is for when you should we'll talk about wheat mm-hmm. and everything. The well, the other is with flowers, it much depends on the grinding process. You can grind whole wheat to an incredibly fine light flour. But often the whole wheat that you buy, it hasn't been ground really fine. So it's, it's a little bit harder. But we use, well, I buy five kilos at a time, uh, white, spelt white and, and wholemeal spelt. And I usually do both of them and that makes, that makes a nice bread. So we're looking at 
the uh, five common allergens. And this is why wheat is an allergen. It is not <coughs> the wheat that God made. It has been changed. And the other is oats. Now, oats are another high lectin food. If lectins get into your blood, they increase the inflammatory process. Traditionally, the Scots, who love their oats, used to soak the oats, sometimes for even two days. And that soaking process even started a bit of culturing and they were a lot easy to digest. And the other common allergen is the refined sugar because it really is a toxic drug. It's pure acid. And because of its high sweet content, it can actually feed any inflammation in the body. So when someone's got any health problems at all, I usually start with the five common allergens, but especially in allergy type responses like your hay fever. But I do say to people, once you eliminate these foods, it can take two months to see a response. Because you can eat a slice of bread, it'll be out of your body in 24 hours, but the effect can remain. So it's important to warn the people, mark it on the calendar when you started to do this. And then uh, watch for two months. A lady whose baby had eczema, the baby's 100% breastfed, so then you go to the mother. And I suggest stopping the allergens. She stopped the allergens. After one month, she said, my baby still have eczema. I said, yes, wait a little longer. <laughs> Here's the time. Let us not be weary in well-doing. We will reap if we faint not. At exactly two months, she sent me a photo of her baby and the skin was beautiful. So it can take that little bit of time. Now, if a person stops this for a month, and has, has a slice of bread, guess what? Back to square one. <laughs> You've got to start your two months again. So especially if it's children, eczema, hay fever, they always respond to eliminating these. And it's not necessarily forever. Once you've conquered your problem, the person might be able to have some oats now and then, some wheat now and then. Who will tell them? Their body. Their response. Their response, that's right, that's right. Their body's response. So you watch for your response. While we're talking about this, can you give some examples what one can eat uh, in, instead of? That's a very good question and this is a very good, good point because for your peanut butter lovers, they can have almond butter, cashew butter and if you come to Australia, you might even be able to have macadamia butter. So there's your alternatives there. To dairy, um, I have a look at where are you using the dairy, usually on cereal and in tea and coffee. Well, you've just taught them that the tea and coffee is best discarded and maybe looking at a better breakfast like we had this morning, an alternate breakfast. And if someone wants to put a little milk on that, they could use coconut milk or they could make their own cashew milk. Wheat, a great alternative to wheat is spelt. But I know in America you can get spelt and you can also get uh, kamut. I don't know if that's one M or two M's. One. And these are all wild hybrids from the original wheat and also um, Enkenhorn. That's the original wheat, and I know in America you can get it in some places. And the Emma wheat. We have found a German bakery in the town where we buy our food that sells a sourdough Emma bread, and it's delicious. It's very nice. So they're, they're some of the grains that you can use instead of the wheat. So what can you do instead of oats? Should the, it be ein, ein Pardon? Ein corn. 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 
and corn. Well, some I have seen some people call it ankhorn, and in some books it's called ankin horn. So I used to say ankhorn, and then I was reading one book where they called it ankin horn, ankin horn. So ankhorn. The uh, granola that we use at our health retreat, because we don't use any of these foods at our retreat. And if someone says, but I love oats, and they sit well with me, you know what I say to them? Eat oats. Your body's response is your best guide. Some can handle it, some can't. So because I don't want our cook to be doing this food for this person and this food for this person, we, we just eliminate them so that the cook can just do food that everyone can eat. So what we do instead of oats, we soak buckwheat. And we find you can only really soak it for about two hours. It goes too sticky. Rinse it well and then dehydrate it for 24 hours. And then it's crunchy. And that makes a very nice uh, granola. Dehydrate means in the oven or just... Dehydrator. If you do it in the oven, you'd have to try and get your oven down to about 100. Mm. Now, so I... The, Celsius. Celsius. 50. And soak it in cold water. Yeah, most ovens won't go under 100 Celsius. Sweet, Our oven, my oven won't go under 120. Mm. So that's a little high. But see the fuel stove around the corner? That was my stove for 12 years when I lived in the rainforest. And I could dehydrate nicely in the warmer down underneath. So, yeah, to do it in the oven, you'd have to have a very, very low heat. Uh, also, if you want to do an alternate to, say, a porridge, you could do millet porridge. Millet makes a delicious porridge. And millet is one grain that has no lectins at all. But ideally you buy the hulled millet and you might have found this um, Casper that it's about three cups of water to one cup of millet, isn't it? Yeah. Takes a lot of water. <coughs> and if you don't put enough water in it, it's just too dry. You want it nice and soft like the porridge, the oat porridge is. But we, we serve uh, millet at our retreat and we serve it with some stewed apple, fruit salad, uh, pear creams, coconut creams with sprinkles on top and our guests love it. So we like to, and this is something to remember, that the food you serve at your retreat is teaching the guests on how to eat when they go home, yeah. of alternatives they can have. Yeah? I have a question uh, considering the symptoms or the response to the uh, wheat or to the oats. I say a lot of people don't even know that they have a problem with that because they don't know which symptoms uh, it comes out of that. Do you I know, you're absolutely right and this is a very good point. The two most common symptoms are brain fog and bloating and how many people live with them. And where does the devil want to attack us? where we communicate with God. So I always say, I always give people a challenge and this is a nice challenge to give your health guests. They've just had a week with you with none of these foods. So they only have to do five more weeks. So the challenge is stop for two months and I'd like to suggest for you all to do it on yourselves because then you'll have a story. So stop for five weeks, sorry, it's two months. So I didn't do the maths right there, did I? I'm looking over to my mathematician here. <laughs> if they stop for a week at your retreat, they've got seven weeks. My husband would be horrified. He's always looking at my maths, which sometimes isn't <laughs> great. <laughs> he, he said my maths are a mess. But my husband... Is my biggest critic, but if I can pass him, I'll pass anyone. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm speaking and I say something, he's up the back with the pen and paper and I think, oh dear, what have I said? <laughs> and he will faithfully tell me. <laughs> yes? 
So with, uh, with oak, that's the lectin that is the issue? It appears that it is. It appears that is it is a couple of things. Yeah. One is not being um, properly cooked. Yeah. And some people say, it's all right, I, I eat the quick oats. Do you know it's no different? It's no different. The starch isn't broken down. And if you culture or do long soaking, long cooking, the lectins are disarmed. But because I find that not as many people have a problem with oats as wheat, I would just rather in our retreats not use them. And again, if people love them and it's fine, when they go home, they can, <laughs> they can certainly do it. But the two grains that have no lectins is millet and sorghum. Now, sorghum traditionally has only been grown for cows, but then they discovered they were gluten-free. And in Australia, you've heard of wheat bix? Uh, Australia Sanitarium Health Food Company, which is Seventh Day Adventist Company, are famous for their wheat bix. So they now make a gluten free wheat bix and it's made with sorghum. No wheat. No. But you can get sorghum flour now. So, sorghum flour, it's good to know that's gluten free and you can use it in. In baking, yes. Now the millet, it's usually probably the quickest you could do it in is about ah uh, about fifty minutes. Yeah, but what is recommendable? Because I had two hours of something like this, and I made the little cooking box and put it there after the rice. Yeah. So boiling it for that long. No, I'm boiling it for 20, 30 minutes yes. and then I put it in yeah. some stew foam box. That's right, that's right. And then it needs to be in that for a few hours. Yeah. That's like your slow cooker, you know, you, um, uh, you've heard of the Instapots. I know my daughter has an Instapot and it can be a pressure cooker or it can be a slow cooker. But one lady I know that's got a lot of children, she does the, she does the millet overnight in the slow cooker and then washes it rinses and brings the legumes to the boil and then put and rinses them again and puts the legumes and all the vegetables in there and that's their lunch. So she said, I'm constantly using my slow cooker. So in, in any area of allergen, they're the five common. So if someone has an allergy, I say it could be an allergy to mold could be an allergy to uh, chemicals or it could be an allergy to certain foods and they're the most common food allergens. Yes? Industry has done something to, to wheat as we discussed before, but has industry done something to oats at all? Uh, mm. Not that I know of, no. not that I know of, but traditionally it always had a, a long cook, mm. whereas today people don't long cook it. Yeah. Uh, refined sugar that's like without any of the food but then you have sugar in the fruit and I'm wondering if maybe that's what Ellen White meant when she she writes about how uh, when you're conserving fruit for the winter that uh, you can conserve fruit um, and use a little bit of sugar enough to conserve it and this she actually used the word this is an excellent substitute I live on a fruit farm, so we're conserving a lot of fruit. So I'm thinking about this a lot and wondering, like, is it all right? Well, the sweetener I use, used to use when I used to bottle of fruit, I would use a bit of palm sugar. And you've heard of palm sugar, coconut sugar? I know you can just buy it in the supermarket now in packets. And it's the crystallized nectar from the palm flower. So it has not been refined like sugar has been. And there are no chemicals. I know in Australia, there's a lot of chemicals used growing sugarcane. But you can get rapidura sugar, which is organic sugarcane that is just the dehydrated cane sugar juice. Of course, that would be uh, unrefined as well. Honey. Pardon? Honey. Yes, honey. Um, honey's great but you want raw honey. Yeah. 
And I wouldn't advise honey for someone who's conquering cancer, who has a yeast problem, who's trying to lose weight, uh, who's a diabetic. So with a diabetic, they need to be very cautious on their sweeteners until their pancreas starts working better. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the reasons people's histamine levels are high, is because their eosinophil levels are high because of an allergy. Can you know what the Eosinophils, you can lower your eosinophils by stop eating the uh, allergen foods. So your eosinophils rise in a response to the allergen foods. Ice is the best anti-inflammatory that there is. And when you use ice for inflammation, what you do is you put it on and off. Might be 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off. 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off. And sometimes, especially in a break or a severe sprained ankle, you just might do the ice. My daughter severely sprained her ankle when she was, oh, I think she was about 11 and she could not bear the ice. So I did a minute hot and a minute cold and a minute hot and a minute cold and she could bear that. So remember you're working with the people and I was just asked, don't you have the hot, don't you put a thermometer in to get the hot right? Well, I find so many differences that different people can handle different heat. So that's why I always, and you know, it is true that the hand can handle more heat than maybe the hips. So you always start not quite as hot. And if the person says, I could have hotter, well, you you can make it hotter. So you're better to start with where the body's happy. And after they've had the ice, they can handle it a little bit hotter. But ice is the best anti-itch. So when I was in um, Alabama a few years ago, I used to walk through the forest where I was staying. I walked through the forest to the health centre. And after a couple of days, I had about six little itches on my leg, an itch here and an itch there and an itch there. And I said, what are these? And they said, oh, they're chiggers. I said, well, I've chiggers. I've never heard of chiggers. And apparently they're a little mite that you get in the bush and it burrows into your skin and it itches. And they said to me here, you'll be itching for three weeks. So I made a decision never to scratch. If you scratch an itch, (coughs) you immediately make it worse. Because when you scratch, not only do you damage the skin a little bit, but that scratching brings more blood to the area. And when you've got more blood to the area, you've got more heat. And more heat on the itch makes the itch worse. So what can you do? You ice it. So what I did, and I only had to do it three times a day, and it would take me sometimes 10 minutes. Freeze, oh, pain. Freeze, oh, pain. See, when that intense pain comes, you lift it. You keep coming back, and you keep coming back, keep coming back. So it would take about 10 minutes to freeze on, off, on, off. So by the time I'd done the... The other five, I'm back to the, to the other one, or five or six. And then once I'd frozen them, uh, no itch, no itch at all. And often it would be like that for maybe four or five hours. And on my morning walk, oh, would they itch? Because when you walk, you increase blood. And when you increase blood, you increase warmth, and oh, they would itch. So I'd run home and grab the ice, <laughs> freeze them. Freeze them, freeze them, freeze them, freeze them. Not one did I, not once did I scratch. And I'd fr- I, just before I went to bed at night, I'd do the freezing scenario, and that would get me through all night. They were totally gone within five days, and no one there could believe it. <laughs> they had never seen that because I didn't scratch. So if someone has eczema, yes, it can take 
eight weeks before it's gone. So what can they do meanwhile? Ice it. Now, icing won't stop the itch forever, but it can stop it for several hours. Several hours. That's one of the beauties of the ice, because ice drives the blood away. <laughs> We're warm-blooded creatures. The blood doesn't want to go where there's ice. So you ice the area. And ice can numb the area. So if you're in pain, too, you can ice the area. But remember, it's on off, on off. You'll want to do that because your response to about <laughs> your response to about 10 seconds of ice is deep pain. So what's your body saying now? Give it a break. And then come back. And on off on off. So an easy way to do this is even to put some ice cubes in a little uh, snap lock bag then you haven't got water everywhere or you can just use a block of ice in a little uh, washer or face cloth and what I've been finding dealing with people with herpes you'll be surprised how many people have the herpes virus in them and once it's in you it's there forever <laughs> but you can manage it so I've seen people implement the laws and instead of getting a herpes breakout monthly they start to get it six monthly and it usually happens uh, usually in the tender parts of the body but you know a cold sore a cold sore is part of the herpes virus and it's just exactly like that I have never had a cold sore but my husband does and it used to be that it was the most painful before it erupted and then when it erupts you've got little tiny blisters and then the blisters break and then the pain is just that rawness. If that person ices it as soon as they get an inkling of discomfort they can prevent it even developing. Yeah? And when you get it in the mouth? Ice it in the mouth. Don't you think that's phenomenal? That it can even stop it from developing? And one lady I'm working with, she's been having herpes in, the, in her private parts. How terribly uncomfortable is that? Her husband's first wife was unfaithful and gave it to him. And then when she married him, that's where it came. And... She was upset because she was a virgin when she married. She said, I have done nothing wrong. And I said, neither is your husband. It was his unfaithful wife. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's what happens. But you can manage it. I said, don't, don't be upset. We're, we're, not in, we're not in heaven yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. These things happen. And oh, how embarrassed she was about it. She almost didn't want to tell me. Because when someone says they have had herpes, the question immediately rises, well, what have you been doing? You know, that's, so we have to be very careful never to be judgmental. Remember, Jesus never was. Number one character trait is merciful. And so I told this lady, try ice. So she'd get a little washer and every time she went to the bathroom and she was going, she was going about every hour and a half, two hours because she was drinking all her water, <laughs> maybe every two or three hours, and she would ice the area. And she said it was incredible the relief that it brought. And if it started to pain, she'd stop and then she'd, she'd ice it again. She said it never developed. So you will, have it, you will have times where you will be dealing with people with herpes. So remember the ice. It's almost the forgotten remedy. It's so simple. Every home should have ice in their freezer. We know if the child hits and bumps their head, we put an ice back on. And yet ice can be used very, very effectively for any inflammation and for itch and for something like herpes. One lady told me that it usually takes 10 days. And she said, you know, when it's first appearing, it's this incredible, heavy, painful feeling. I said. 
And then when the little blisters burst, then it's incredibly, incredibly painful. Then I said, I said, she said, it usually takes 10 days. She said, this was resolved in five days, just from the ice. Yes? How do you tell when you should do only cold versus hot and cold? Well, remember I said about my daughter who was about 11 and ha had fallen and she sprained her, it was from her knee down. And I would have liked to have put ice on there, but she couldn't handle it. So I did the hot and coals, and she could handle that. So that's, so it's the response, the response that usually gives it. And if a person has sprained their ankle, and you're doing hot and coals, and you notice it's still swelling, you do more cold and less hot. So but it's, you were saying for inflammation that you talked about all the treatments that it was best to do hot and cold. Well, if the body's inflammation doesn't go down, then you do more cold. So you're watching your body's response. But I, I, I was called to a girl who had just been trodden on the foot by a horse. So she's going to get big inflammation, you just do cold. And she did not like it, so we kept giving her breaks, going back on, off. It's good to do it to yourself and just see. See the pain, deep pain, take it off. And if you've got an injury there, you feel even more pain. But eventually it, it kills it. It kills it. It has no pain because it just numbs the whole area. But you've got to go on and off. You've got to work with the body's response. So severe inflammation, it's usually ice, but then sometimes not everyone can handle the ice. Yeah? Uh, with the hot and cold, can it have uh, very negative effects to go into depressants, i.e. beyond three minutes and beyond th uh, 30 seconds? Well, it all depends if you want to depress the area. And when you've got a lot of inflammation rising, you want to depress the area because you don't want more of the inflammation coming in. So that again is where your body's res the, the body's response will, will guide you. Mm. It will tell you. Yeah? For which people it could be harmful to make this hot and cold? Is it for every people in every condition? Good? That's a very good question. What I find is that the very young and the very old you have to be cautious with. But where you particularly have to give caution is for people who have no feeling in their feet. So this can be diabetics, this can be people with peripheral neuropathy, that is a side effect of chemotherapy, is peripheral neuropathy, and people with very cold feet. You never put cold feet into a bucket of hot water. Well, how do you warm their feet up? You put cold feet into lukewarm water. And you might be able to warm it up a little bit more. Could and also massaging the feet can get the blood to that area. Should one also be cautious with certain heart conditions? I haven't found so. No. The caution more is the circulation. If someone's got no feeling in their feet and you put their feet in hot water, someone has cold feet and you put their feet in the hot water, you can damage the tissues. You have to be very cautious there. When we look at poultices, we'll be looking at a cane pepper compress on the bottom of the feet. So if they can't have hot and colds, they can have a cane compress. And that's very safe. They will never be hurt by that. What I always do when I'm doing a hot foot bath, I put the person's foot in my hand. And so my hand goes into the hot water first. And then and I feel that, so I've got an idea. And then I look at the person's face. And if they go, oh, take it straight out. Because not everyone can handle it. But of course, if their feet are cold, you're not going to put them in there. It'll, you put it in lukewarm water. And you might massage their feet. Massaging feet. I've massaged cold feet and within 20 minutes they're warm. Because when you massage, you're, you're calling the blood to the area. Remember, the blood is the life. That's the healer. Perfect health requires perfect circulation. And when a person's feet are cold, they don't have perf perfect circulation. Perfect circulation means my whole body's the same temperature. And I find there's a lot of women 
in cold weather they're wearing little sandals. <laughs> They've got cold feet. One lady told me that, oh, shit, I've had cold feet for years. Now my toes are numb. See, the blood feeds the nerves. If you haven't got blood going down there, if you've got cold feet, you haven't got blood going into the feet. So the nerves start to die. Do you know what's next? Gangrene. The toes start to die. Because the blood's the life of the flesh. We're going to get blood into that area. That's why exercise is so important. Gets the blood out to the extremity. It's just become popular again in Sweden for young girls to have the tummy, stomach ah, showing. Yes. I think we're going to have a lot of kidney kidneys. problems because around here there's the kidneys. Mm. They get cold and they chill. Now what these young girls would be horrified to know is when the kidneys get cold, the body has to get that blood in there to because it's purifying the blood. So what the body will do is it'll develop extra fat around the kidneys. And the, the girls don't want fat, <laughs> thick waist. They want slender waist. Well, if you want a slender waist, you have to keep it very warm. Because <laughs> the kidneys must be warm. Now, there's something I didn't respond to the other day. I didn't mention this morning and I didn't carry through with it, fun. Remember I wrote fun on the board? Do you remember Sick Steve said to Healthy Harry, you're taking all the fun out of life? Yep. Well, in his book, uh, Colin Campbell, all the research that he did, he stopped dairy, he stopped meat. He, was, he grew up on a dairy farm. He started to eat a plant-based diet. He said, my friends say I've taken all the fun out. I've stopped the coffee. I've stopped all the stimulants, the alcohol. He said, I'm 70 now and I'm having a lot of fun with my grandkids. I climb mountains with them. Half my friends are dead. The other half are limping around with walking sticks, rattling when they walk. You know what the rattle is? All the pharmaceutical drugs they're on. And he said, and I am having fun. <laughs> So we've forgotten what fun is. You know, fun is feeling good and enjoying life every minute of the day. And isn't that what God wanted us to be in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2? Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayst prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. That's God's design for us. So my aim this afternoon was to give you some simple and basic hydrotherapy uh, hydrotherapy um, procedures that you can do but there is one more I'd like to do and I think we've got time to do one more and that is the wet sheet pack and the wet sheet pack is wrapping a body in a wet sheet and so what you do is you have a table maybe a table like this and you have a you have a folded up blanket underneath and then you have a shower curtain and then you have a woolen blanket and then you wring out a, a wet sheet and, and lay it over and then you lay the person on it. And when you lay the person on it, their legs are apart and their arms are in the air and one, <coughs> one side, let's say the right side, goes under the arm and between the legs and you quickly put the arms down, got to work very quickly because it's very uncomfortable for them. And then the left side goes over the arms and over the legs. Then you quickly put the blanket around them. As soon as the blanket goes around them, their body starts to warm up the wet sheet. Can you imagine if we asked you to lie on a cold wet sheet right now, just in your underwear? Oh. <laughs> so why would you do such a thing? There's three reasons why you would give a wet sheet pack. And one reason is, the number one reason is for a fever. Do you remember I said water puts the fire out? This is the most effective way to get a fever down. See, one of the problems with a fever is it can't get rid of the heat quick enough. So when you wrap the body in a cold, wet sheet, mind you, the discomfort is very brief. That's why you, you work fast, because as soon as that woolen blanket is around the wet sheet, they warm up. 
and you can put your hand down there sometimes in 10 minutes and the sheet is hot. Where's the heat come from? The body. It's pulled the heat out of the body. And sometimes just being in a wet sheet pack for even 20 minutes is enough to bring the temperature down a bit. So the person's a little bit more comfortable. So you, it's the most effective way to reduce a fever. A question. I just heard now that we should not uh, that fast bring the fever down. Well, do you know the body's just doing it down as it can? <clears throat> But it's been used for centuries and I've used it so many times it's incredibly effective. And if the body still has rubbish to burn up, the fever will remain, but it won't be as hot. So I never wanted to take the fever away. I just wanted to make it comfortable for the person. So I told you I had COVID for a couple of days and I had a fever. There was not at any point a need for me to do anything about my fever because it never got to the point of being incredibly uncomfortable. And you know when someone's uncomfortable, they start th thrashing around, you know. It's, <coughs> it's just too hot. I never take a temperature. I just put my hand there. Ooh, that's hot. Maybe we better do a wet sheet pack. But I believe then when you live healthy, have this uh, seven points or eight points, then we don't feel the fever as the other people. People who are unhealthy living, I think they feel the fever much more than we do. But what I also find is that you get someone living very well, but they didn't live well 20 years ago. And the body lets the rubbish go as it can. So, so I would only use a wet sheet pack if the person was incredibly uncomfortable. Another way to bring a fever down is just a tepid bath. That's not hot and that's not cold. Just a tepid bath. And when the feverish person gets out of the bath, the water's hotter than when they went in. In other words, the water has pulled the heat out of the body. And often that can just bring it down enough to make them comfortable. But the simplest thing you can do to get a fever down a bit is to put the person's feet in hot water. You, f you, you feel a person's feet when they've got a fever, they're usually cold. And when you put their feet in hot water, then the heat is drawn down to the feet and goes out. And cool to the head. That's a very simple one. So a cold bath would be too drastic. That's right. And you wouldn't, and they would hate it because mm. it's too much of a jolt on the system. Mm. Better to do a tepid bath. And, but the wet sheet pack is still okay. It, it is the most effective. It's a lot more work, as you can imagine, but it is effective. So you would give the wet sheet pack to reduce a fever. You would give a wet sheet back to create a fever. Why would you create a fever? You would create a fever to speed up a cold. So when you create a fever, you do the wet sheet pack and you have a hot water bottle against their feet. And instead of putting one blanket on, you might put three. Or if that's too heavy, you put two blankets on and a a feather quilt over the top and create a fever. Because when the body gets up to 40 degrees, circulation is increased 400%. Metabolism increases 400%. Your bone marrow can make more blood, more white blood cells. That's why the fever has been used for centuries. In fact, there's one form of cancer treatment where they give fever bars every day to create that high heat. What's the third reason that you would use a wet sheet pack? To relax. If someone's very stressed out, wrap them in a wet sheet pack. That moist heat, because remember, the, the sheet warms up very quickly. That's why if you're going to use it to create a fever or to relax, you must make sure it's a warm body that goes into them. 
and you'll find often the person will fall asleep in the wet sheet back because that moist heat is so relaxing on the muscles. You can also use it to draw out poisons. And this, I guess you're doing the same thing when you're creating, when you're creating the fever. Because when you create the fever, the person starts to perspire. So someone might create a fever to speed up going through a cold, or they might create a fever <coughs> to draw out poisons. It's important that the person be well hydrated because they're losing a lot of moisture out of their skin. Uh, the sheet, when you want to create a fever, does it have to be warm? Yeah. Well, even if you do it in warm water, by the time you spread it out, by the time the person's on it, it's cold because <laughs> of the air touching it. So the point is... A warm water bottle on the feet. That's right. And if they're a bit cool, give, get them to have a hot shower to warm up before they jump in the wet sheet pack. Wait, so creating the fever is not supposed to be cold, a cold sheet? Yeah. It was supposed to be cold. In fact, it's, they're all cold. You can't do it any other way. Yeah. By the time you wring it out and lay it over the bed, even if it was hot, it's cold. It's, the air cools it. But what was it with the shower, warm shower? And the well, if you've shower? got a thin person who's cold, then you would give them a hot shower because you want the warm body into the cold sheet. Also with fever. Well, you don't have to warm them up with the fever because they're very, very hot. Mm. But if you're creating a fever, remember you put the hot water bottle on the bottom of the feet, that'll warm them up. So it is the body's heat that generates the heat in the wet sheet pack. But that's another very old treatment, been used for centuries. So these simple water treatments, uh, they've been used time and time and time again. Yes? Is the Bible talking about uh, water therapy, hydrotherapy in any of the verses? I have not seen that it specifically talks about water therapies, except in uh, the Naaman <laughs> who had to dip in the water seven mm. times yes. and be healed. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar? He was wet on the ground. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wet you on the ground. Are there any more questions before we close? Uh, coming back to herpes, ice is kind of the only thing one can do to hold it down. You cannot type of curing. Well, you can, it, it will always be in the body, but if you keep the eight laws of health and live well, the outbreaks will be minor. And I've seen people that were having monthly outbreaks go to six monthly outbreaks, even to go to even once a year outbreak. Mm. And dealing with, and Applying the ice, it, it recovers very quickly. Does it have to do, uh, does it something have to do with the activity of the immune system? Because like what people are saying is if the immune system goes down or if you are stressed or if you have, I don't know, what kind of factor, outside factor. Um, yeah, that, 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 that certainly can trigger it a little bit. And that's what you'll find when you ascertain the cause. Mm. You, uh, you look at the history, look at what's happened. Sometimes it can be a death in the family and then lost a job. And then, I don't know, there's a whole lot of factors that can come into play. With every person that's different, that's why it's important that ev everyone is treated differently. You can have 10 people with with um, with the condition, but it be, can, can be different factors in every case that can come together. Yes? We talked about uh, the immune system before and the white blood cells, uh, but what about, because 
it's been mentioned quite often now with uh, Corona, static uh, storms. What are they in comparison to what we've talked about uh, so far? Well, the cytokine storms are really an inflammatory response. And there's a reason for the inflammatory response. Mm. So it's also been determined that the only people that die from COVID are people with pre-existing health conditions. Mm. And one lady said to me, but my mother, she's only 50, she eats really well. And she was in hospital, she had to be given oxygen. So I said to her, Tell me a little bit about your mother. What about the house she lives in? Oh, it's a mouldy house. Mm -hmm. Can you see there's another factor there? And remember what disease is? So corona, uh, the corona is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that arise because of a violation of the, of the laws of health. So what law had this lady violated, and maybe in ignorance, was she was breeding in mouldy, mouldy air. And as I said, I think on the first night, sometimes it can be a bad tooth that's leaking poison into you. It, you know, there can be a whole lot of different factors that can come to play. That's why you've got to dig, um, dig deep. And the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What people say, note what they say. I, often I write down exactly what they say because their words can, can give indications in certain areas. And you've also got the Holy Spirit that can give you wisdom and guidance as to as to what area to go. And, and this um, eating healthy is, uh, in, in, in our terms, it's uh, perhaps uh, vegan, but in, in other people's terms, it's, uh, it could be meat. Uh, ecological That's right. Perhaps, but That's right. Meat and, uh, and, uh, you know, That's water, right. Water, that, water drink. But I have to tell you that the healthiest couple that have done our retreat were organic dairy farmers. Mm. <laughs> Any meat they ate, and it wasn't much, was organic. If they had dairy, it wasn't much, and it was organic. Mm. All their food was organic. They exercised every day. I, I could not find any fault with this couple. Mm. And Dr. Cal um, Colin Campbell, in his book, he said, 20% animal protein is what really triggers disease, and that's almost like three times a day. But 5% animal protein doesn't. And 5% animal protein is a little bit. Now, as I say this, I advocate a plant-based diet. <laughs> but it's also to show that I have met some very sick vegetarians. <laughs> and this couple was a very healthy couple. That, that, but what meat they ate was organic and it wasn't very much. That's how they got away with it. I read about Linda, Linda McCartney, American Linda McCartney. Yeah. She uh, fry, uh, deep fried everything, everything, but she was a vegan. Yes, yes, yes. We had a cook once. This is about, I don't know, 11 years ago. She was quite overweight. And everything she ate, she deep fried. Anyway, we didn't have her for very long. Because the guests would say, how come she's big? You see, the guests want to see that yeah. you're doing it. Now, it is true. Some people are thicker set than others. You know, that, you know there's always going to be variations in size. But this lady was very large. But I, I know I was in an area once and they were saying, it's vegan, it's vegan. And, but I was the, the worst food, I would never eat it because it was vegan cheese and vegan whipped cream and vegan custard and, uh, and it was so high in sugar and chemicals. And so I don't call myself a vegan anymore. I say I'm a, I ate a plant-based diet, <laughs> which is plants as God made, yes? Just, just back to uh, one more comment about the cy cytokine storm. So uh, what we are really saying is that uh, if that happens, because they're saying that it's it really the uh, uh, immune defense that it's running havoc, it's, it's uh, causing havoc. But th there would be a reason why it's running havoc. Yeah, and that's what I'm coming to. So, so what we're really saying is that the conditions in the body are so bad that the immune yeah. system has to react the way it does. That's right, that's, that's right. Point. It's not the coronavirus that causes a cytokine storm. Mm. It's 
it, it can be a whole lot of other things. Poisons. Like this lady that lived in the Māori house. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I was intrigued, how come a lady like that could go down? Mm. And, and then I found out why. So it's always interesting digging and finding out the causes. Yes? Uh, earlier I, uh, <clears throat> I love uh, cheese with, with mould in, inside. Mm. Uh, I realize that that is not good to eat. Uh, what is the bad thing about it? Well, the blue is mold, mm. <laughs> and mold is a toxin to the human body. Mm. But it is also true if we've got strong hydrochloric acid, um, it can kill the mold. And in my book, Self Heal by Design, I've got a chapter called The Stomach Secret Women Hydrochloric Acid. Most people don't realise it's part of our immune system because if anything comes in on the food that's not good, our hydrochloric acid can wipe it out. But, you know, if it's not all wiped out and it gets into the bloodstream, it can cause a variety of problems. So, yes, my advice is um, try something else. <laughs> I also know your tastes do change. My tastes have changed. time they do you start to uh, enjoy the simpler things food should taste fantastic that is true <laughs> <laughs>